Welcome back. We're going to take a look at section 8.2 now where we get into looking specifically at a confidence interval for a proportion. So you're going to see some conditions that we've seen before, some new ones. We're going to talk about how to find a critical value, how to construct and interpret the confidence interval, and then how to find a sample size based on some characteristics that they've given you. All right, so take a look at these questions here. What proportion of U.S. adults are unemployed right now? We don't know that. In the previous chapter, chapter seven, we assumed we knew the parameter. Reality is you're not. So we take samples to estimate the parameter. So it's very unlikely that if I take a sample for that first question and I get like 12%, that that's really the parameter. So what I do is I say, I have a little margin of error. I say I'm 95% confident that, tr that the interval between like eight and 20% captures the true proportion of U.S. adults that are unemployed now. And that's what this unit or this section is going to do. All right. So conditions. There are certain conditions that have to be met. We have to have a random sample. If we don't have a random sample, then we can't, we can still construct a confidence interval, but it, we're not going to be able to generalize it, and it's going to be based on a bad sample. It's going to be biased. So you have to have a random sample. The 10% condition, again, we're sampling without replacement here. So the sample size has to be less than 10% of the population size. If that's true, we can calculate the standard deviation. We saw this back in Chapter 7, so this is not new. The large counts condition, this is not new. However, there's going to be a slight tweak. When we did it before, it was n times p and n times 1 minus p. The problem is we don't know the parameter. We don't know p. So we estimate it with the sample proportion, or p hat. So the advice I gave you before was do not use symbols. Same deal here. Don't use symbols. So we have three conditions. The random condition, 10% condition, large counts condition. All right. So those are your three, and you'll notice the, the new symbol here. Again, don't bother with the symbols at all. Just go right to the numbers. Okay, this just goes through checking the three conditions, what happens if one of the conditions is violated. Then you're going to get a confidence interval that's worthless and doesn't tell you any information, essentially. All right, so take a look at the check your understanding. Why don't you work through this? Pause the video now and then come back when you're done. So in this first question, are the conditions met? Uh, let's see. They asked the first 100 students to, who arrived. No, this is not a random sample. They just asked the first 100 students if they slept at least eight hours. Well, maybe the students who slept at least eight hours are have more energy in the morning and they're li more likely to get to school. So this is not okay. All right. Oh, they do go through... Uh, oh, the conditions. Okay, if one fails, it's done. It doesn't matter. The rest, the 10% works and the large counts, there were 17 yeses. That'd be 83 no's. Quality control expect, inspector takes a random sample of 25. Boom, random sample, random condition is met. Um, 25 bags is less than 10% of thousands of bags filled an hour. Check. So I could calculate the standard deviation. Of the bag selected, three had too much salt. So I have three successes out of 25 and 22 failures. The large counts condition isn't met. Three is not bigger than 10, greater than or equal to 10, so this is not going to work. All right, moving on. So how do we construct a confidence interval for the population proportion? Well, we're going to use the sampling distribution, which we talked a lot about back in Chapter 7. The mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the real proportion and the standard deviation. Now, here's the problem. We don't know the real proportion, so both of these are going to need some slight tweaks. Okay, so instead of standard deviation, we use something called standard error. And there's just a slight difference here. We don't know the population proportion, so we estimate it with the sample proportion, p hat. That's the only difference, okay? That's our best estimate that we have. All right, to get these critical values, so they're going to give you your confidence level in most instances. 95% is one of the most common. So if you're 95% confident, 
that means you have 95% of the area in the middle of the distribution, which leaves 2.5% in each tail. So what you can do is inverse norm 0 0.025, and that will give you your critical value. So if I have 80% in the middle, 10% in each tail, I would do inverse norm of 0.1 to get my critical value. We're always going to take the positive, the absolute value of it. The more confidence you have, the wider your interval needs to be. Because if this is 95 and I go to 99, I have to go further out. So I'm going to have to be more standard deviations away from the mean. All right, so that talks about the confidence interval, critical value. Okay, so here's the official formula for what's called a one proportion or one sample Z interval. You take your point estimate, your sample proportion, plus or minus your critical value. We just went over how to do that, getting that from the calculator using inverse norm, times the standard error. And this was standard error because we're estimating the true proportion with the sample proportion. Okay. So here goes. Um, here's an example you could take a look at. Don't forget, you can push these play buttons to help you see somebody else talking through the example very detailed in a detailed manner. All right, let's just go right to the check of understanding. So at this point, you work through it. Pause the video. Come back when you're done. Number one, the parameter of interest, they're looking in words and symbols. So I'm trying to estimate the true proportion of college students who have had five or more drinks in a row three or more times in the past two weeks. So P would represent the true proportion of that, the true proportion of all U.S. college students who are classified as frequent binge drinkers. We don't know that. We're trying to estimate it. Uh, conditions. Was it a random sample? Yes. Random sample of 10,904. Check. Uh, 10,904 is less than 10% of all U.S. college students. Absolutely. Check. So I could calculate standard deviation. And this is the number of successes I have. Remember, for large counts, you need at least 10 successes and 10 failures. Success is just a generic term. Being a binge drinker is not a success. You have 2,500 successes. When I subtract these two numbers, I'd have about uh, 8,500 quote unquote failures. So conditions look good. Let's double check there. Let me, yep. Okay. Um, part three find the critical value. So I have 99% confidence. I have half a percent in the lower tail, half a percent in the upper tail. So 0 0.005. So I would inverse norm 0 0.005. And they're going to get negative, .2, negative 2.576. Just use the absolute value of that. And then to actually construct your interval, you take your sample statistic. Where did this come from? It's the 2,486 students divided by the 10,904. That's about 23%. Plus or minus that critical value times your standard error, your sample proportion times one minus the sample proportion divided by the sample size. Square root of that. You're just doing a little math there to actually get the interval. And then the last thing is going to ask you to, I, I assume, interpret the interval. Why I can't, hey, there we go. Interpret the interval. So we're 99% confident that the true proportion of U.S. college students who classify as binge drinkers is between 0.218 and 0.238. And that's that. So that's really the, the four-step process. Okay, putting it all, hey, the four-step process, look at that. It's almost like I've done this before. We are going to focus solely on the state plan, do, and conclude. This structure is going to be insanely important over the course of the next, like, three units, maybe four, three or four units. So get used to doing this. What I like to do is take a page and just split it into four quadrants. It guarantees that you're thinking of these four steps. Each one essentially earns you one out of four points. So the state is just what is the parameter in words and symbols. And the plan is checking your conditions. The do is doing the calculations to get the interval. And the conclude is the interpretation. So there's one done out here. I just want to kind of highlight. Um, so you'll see in the state step. We're trying to estimate the true parameter, blah, 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 the plan. There are your conditions. 
random 10% large counts, then you get into the actual calculation, and then your conclusion. It tells you how to do this on a calculator. We're not going to do that for a while. All right, the last part of this unit is choosing a sample size or the section. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to base it off the critical value, which is based on the confidence level, and what happened in the sample. Now, sometimes you won't know what happened in the sample. And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to use 0.5. That is the most conservative we can be. If we have no idea what the outcome is, we could say it's 50-50. So you'll notice here, determine the sample size needed to estimate the parameter within 3% of, with 95% confidence. Okay, that 3% is your margin of error. 95% confidence, so 2.5% in each tail. I inverse norm 0 0.025, I get this 1.96 here. Nowhere in here did they tell me anything about a previous sample proportion, so that's why we're using 0.5. I typically just use this as an equal sign. I don't do the inequality. You'll see that in class. You do all the math. This is some quote unquote hard math because for this class at least, you get this number. You need to sample at least 1,067.111 people. I can't sample a fraction of a person, so we always round up. That's why I don't bother to use the inequality, but that's just me. So we'd have to sample at least 1,068 people to guarantee we had no more than a 3% margin of error with this 95% confidence. All right. So uh, again, pause the video. Let's take a look at the check your understanding. All right, in uh, number one, we have 80% of customers surveyed. That's our best guess. Margin of error, 3%. 95% confidence, we just went over that above. That's gonna give me a critical value of 1.96. And I'm gonna set up my standard error with 0.8 and 1 minus 0.8 to get the 0.2. Then it's just doing some work. I'm rounding up, so we have to sample at least 683 customers. If we go 99% confidence now, now the critical value changes. Now I only have half a percent in each tail, so I'm gonna inverse norm 0.005. And I get a larger critical value. Everything else stays the same except this would now be, uh, you, I'm pointing at my screen like you could see it, this would now be 2.576. So because that increased confidence, we're going to have to take a larger sample size to get um, still within that 3% margin of error. So summarizing, three conditions we have to check. Random, 10% large counts. We're not using any symbols for large counts. Most times we're not actually doing any math. Just take the number of successes, subtract that from the sample size, That'll give you your number of failures. Are they at least 10? Here's our structure for creating a confidence interval, our one proportion Z interval, we're going to call it. And then we're just going to follow that four-step process, state, plan, do, and conclude. And the last thing was being able to calculate a sample size based on some given criteria. So that's it for section 8.2.